Life is getting more expensive. All around the world, people are watching as prices get pumped up by forces beyond their control. I'm talking about inflation. Right now, countries and even entire continents are seeing costs increase for everything from food to clothing to fuel. Going to the grocery store, food is way more expensive than it was even a year ago. So a lot of people are having trouble making ends meet. In this video, we'll explore why. First thing CEOs will do is pass the prices on to consumers. We'll also look at what's being done to tackle inflation and whether those measures are working or simply making things worse. It's cut policy rates aggressively this year and inflation as a result has spiraled out of control. Welcome to Business Beyond. Let's begin in the United States, where inflation is at a 40-year high. A survey by the US Census Bureau suggests in the richest country in the world, people are struggling to be able to afford what they need. Roughly a quarter of the people who make less than the poverty line have said, yes, I'm hungry and I don't have enough food because I can't afford it. And then people who are, you know, even above the poverty line, but kind of like lower middle class, um, you know, and even middle middle class. So people making up to $50,000 a year, you know, at least 11% of those people are saying, yes, I'm hungry. And the reason why is because I can't afford to buy food. So how did the United States get here? This may sound counterintuitive, but actually the pandemic made Americans on average richer. The US government sent out thousands of dollars in stimulus checks. People who lost their jobs received months of generous unemployment benefits. And soaring stock prices boosted the wealth of the wealthiest. As a result, savings soared. And starting in early 2021, Americans began to spend that money on things like tech and clothes and going to reopened restaurants and bars. But high demand has collided with snarled up supply chains. And at least in the US, a lot of goods are imported. From where? From Asia, China in particular. And China and many other Asian economies have a zero tolerance policy for COVID-19. So whenever there's an outbreak, um, factories are shut down, workers are not allowed to move around, people can't engage in activities. And so that affects the supply chain. So you have strong demand for these goods, imported goods, insufficient supply of those goods. And so that leads to higher inflation. And the costs of doing business keep getting higher too. Apart from expensive raw materials, businesses are also struggling with staff shortages. Finding people, especially for in-person work in the retail or hospitality industries, has become difficult for various reasons including increased illness risk or difficulty finding childcare for children who can't go into school. Businesses are raising wages to attract workers. And for some businesses, they can absorb that into their profit margins or they might cut costs somewhere else to accommodate for the wages. In the US, the first thing CEOs will do is pass the prices on to consumers, contributing to inflation. The US Federal Reserve has indicated it could increase interest rates three times during 2022. Now, higher rates make borrowing more expensive and saving more appealing. It encourages people to put their money away rather than spend it. That would suppress demand and prevent prices from getting ever higher, heading off a potential wage price spiral. If people start going to their bosses and saying, well, you know, everything costs more, <laughs> I need a raise, <laughs> then, then it begins. So the boss says, okay, I'll give you a raise. But then if everybody gets a raise and businesses, companies will say, well, now I can charge more. It just becomes this vicious cycle. Across the Atlantic, in the countries that use the euro, the risks of inflation are also being assessed. Here in Europe, the surge in inflation has been particularly surprising because over the past decade, policymakers have been battling the precise opposite problem, stubbornly low inflation. 
Europe was an example of this, but actually this is a developed economy issue. The concern was sort of the Japanification of the entire developed world. Um, and what's really behind that is an excess of savings, so a savings glut. But saving money is good, right? Well, not always. Over the past two decades, people in developed countries have been saving a lot of money. Too much, actually. It means they haven't been spending or investing as much as they could be. And that, in turn, can constrain economic growth and inflation. In the first months of the pandemic, fears over low inflation deepened. Inflation actually turned negative in the Eurozone as people stayed home and businesses shut, reducing demand and prices for goods and commodities. As in the US, that changed in 2021, in part thanks to a vaccine rollout that allowed businesses and consumers to start spending again, driving demand and prices back up. But that's just part of the story. It leaves out the single most important driver of inflation here. Inflation has been driven much more by uh, energy costs in Europe. And the causes for higher energy costs are multiple. They range from weather patterns, so the wind didn't blow as much off the shores of Germany as they had in the past, um, a lack of investment in infrastructure, particularly renewable energy, low, uh, so low inventories for oil and gas already, and then, of course, geopolitical strains with Russia amassing troops and weapons along the border with Ukraine that has caused a big change in pricing for energy. Energy bills for households in Western Europe are expected to soar this year by as much as 54%. That's left policymakers at the European Central Bank in Frankfurt in a tricky spot. Their only job is to control inflation, and inflation has been running significantly above their 2% target. There's really nothing that the ECB can do about energy costs. Um, and so I do think that given that the fiscal stimulus in Europe was much uh, smaller than in the US, you're not facing the kind of demand-driven inflation in Europe that you are in the US. And so there's very little uh, that the ECB has in its toolbox to address it. ECB President Christine Lagarde has been crystal clear. The central bank believes that this surge in inflation will pass, and soon. The ECB expects inflation to fall sharply this year as the heat's taken out of the energy market. This is just a temporary um, blip in terms of higher inflation because we still have a glut of savings. Um, there are a number of kind of big structural drivers of high savings, high national savings across the developed world, and they include things like demographics, which haven't changed at all. If anything, they've just been made worse because of the pandemic. So I think that in a year or two, this glut of savings should reassert itself. Leaving the Eurozone now and on to its eastern neighbour, Turkey, where the inflation story is largely one of self-inflicted pain. Turkey is experiencing one of the world's most brutal inflation surges, but unlike much of the rest of the world, it didn't start with supply chain shortages, soaring commodities prices or skyrocketing demand. Many economists say the blame lies squarely at the feet of Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Erdogan doesn't believe in the, the basics of monetary policy, in the basics of, of, uh, of uh, market economics, which is that higher interest rates uh, counter inflation. He doesn't believe that. He argues that high interest rates cause inflation. Bundan sonraki süreçte faiz politikamızın nasıl hangi türde şekillendiğini de en kısa zamanda göreceksiniz. The Central Bank of Turkey has not been able to run uh, orthodox policy. It's cut policy rates aggressively this year or over the last year on direction from Erdogan. Uh, infl and inflation as a result has spiraled out of control. Turkey's government statistics agency puts inflation at an already breathtaking 36%. However, researchers analyzing thousands of prices within Turkey say inflation is more like 83%. The feeling of the people uh, are totally different from the government pressured inflation figures uh, on the street, on the daily life. I'm more than a little bit, because if you look at it, everything is 
en az 3 katına çıktı. Çarşıda, pazarda, markette hissediyoruz. %50 civarında falan enflasyon. Belki biraz daha üzerindedir. Asla inanmıyorum şu anda. En ucuz ekmek nerede diye bakıyorum 2 saattir gittim onu aldım. Enflasyon oranı bence şu anda %100'lerde gibi bir şey. But no matter how high inflation gets, Erdogan continues to insist that interest rates are kept low. And he's shown he's willing to sack any central banker who disagrees with him. This unconventional approach has had a number of knock-on effects for the Turkish economy. Among them, it's put off foreign businesses and investors. 2010-11, everyone wanted to get into Turkey invest. It had high growth, great demographics, good banks, good corporates. What's changed there is an orthodox policy, which means stop-go cycles, makes it very difficult to plan. Uh, you know, if, if you don't know what it, what inflation is going to be and where the exchange rate is going to be, how can any business uh, plan investment and, and broader activity? But worse, it's led to a sharp deterioration in the lives of most Turks. In the capital Istanbul, people wait in long lines for subsidized bread. That means Erdogan's controversial economic approach could end up costing him his presidency. He's up for re-election in 2023, and opinion polls show support for him eroding. The last decade of AKP rule uh, under Erdogan unchained has been one of, um, you know, living standards uh, falling, of inequality rising. Ultimately, that will 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 make it very difficult for Erdogan to be re-elected. Re-election or no re-election, enough damage has already been done. And experts say it could only get worse if Turkey continues on its current path. I believe that the Turkish economy will be experiencing the sudden stop in two or three years. Inflation will be reaching to the three-digit level. The profit will be lower than the average cost of the production. Then, uh, for any firm, there will be no single reason to open the door and make the production in the short run and in the mid run. Our next stop shows how easily frustration over inflation can boil over into political crisis. Kazakhstan has long been seen as an example of a remarkably stable post-Soviet state, one with vast oil and gas reserves, plenty of foreign investment, and a regime that's been in place since the fall of the Soviet Union 30 years ago. That changed in January as protests rocked the Central Asian country. What began as a demonstration over a government decision to remove price controls on a key fuel source turned into a wider backlash of a rising inflation and inequality. The demonstrations hit a raw nervous seam of, of unhappiness in Kazakhstan that uh, elites in the country had, had milked those um, those massive uh, earnings from from raw materials and kept most of them themselves and hadn't actually distributed very much down to the lower level. So, you know, this was also, uh, this was about inequality and uh, social injustice and falling living standards. So something, so, so two, two, two important points, I think, but inflation certainly was a spark. And that leaves Kazakhstan facing twin economic and political crises. And while the protests have since been quelled, Neither crisis shows any signs of being close to being resolved. In the end, President Tokayev seems to have only been able to restore order with the backstop of Russian troops. It was President Putin essentially saying, Tokayev is my man, I'm willing to back him. And the challenge, I think, there is um, what that means for Kazakh sovereignty. Um, Putin, uh, the, there will be a fee to be paid or a price to be paid for that. More than 200 people died in January's protests in Kazakhstan, according to the authorities there, and 8,000 people were detained. Kazakhstan should serve as a cautionary tale to the rest of the developing world. In the poorest countries, inflation is threatening people's abilities to feed themselves, to keep a roof over their heads, or to put fuel in their cars to get to work. For politicians, that's something that's becoming impossible to ignore. Higher inflation ultimately means lower growth, but it also means um, the poor suffer dis disproportionately. Many of these countries already have weak social and political systems. They're vulnerable. They're very vulnerable um, unless they quickly get inflation under control. Inflation affects everyone. We all need food, clothes and a way to keep warm. 
That's why policymakers have a vital job in keeping it under control and protecting the poorest among us, wherever we are in the world. And that's it from this edition of Business Beyond. If you've enjoyed it, do hit like and subscribe. And while you're here, why not check out one of our other videos? We recently did one about the global energy crisis that's well worth a watch. Until next time, take care.